No, I think we have worried for quite some time what we would do at the last minute the speaker said, sorry, I have COVID. And that happened this week, but Aaron was so great about stepping in for uh, John Freeborn, who was supposed to be here. John not only got COVID, but he thought he'd be okay today. And then his wife was also tested positive. So, Aaron, we really appreciate you stepping in. Welcome to Montrose Forum. And tell us, oh, we're also having a small problem. We can't get the, the clicker to work to advance the slides. So she's gonna have to stay over there. So you're gonna have to direct your attention whether you wanna listen, look at the speaker or look at the board, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Yes, like she said, my name is Erin Vogel. I'm one of our park rangers at the park down in Bridge Bay. Um, John does wish that he could be here today, but um, we're happy that he's social distancing and uh, taking care of his family. Um, John has been with the park since 2006, and uh, recently he just promoted into our park manager role, so we're really grateful for his leadership and park knowledge and kind of the industry knowledge to, to be a leader for us at the park. Um, I've been a park ranger with CBW, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, for three and a half years, and I recently transferred to the park in December from another park in the state. So I'm excited to be down here. I'm loving Montrose. It's been a lot of fun. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the park, um, a little bit about CBW as a whole, and then kind of get into our current projects and what's going on with the park, um, just to give the community an update. So if you're all familiar uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, this is our mission statement. In 2011, we merged um, together, so Department of uh, Wildlife and then uh, Colorado State Parks. And so this is our mission statement. It's complicated because we are two big agencies that came together and we have um, different goals, but also the same goals. And so it's really lent itself well to be a combined agency now. So what does CPW do? Um, we have a lot of different lands that we manage. Um, across the state, we have 43 state parks. Um, a couple of years ago, we added Fisher Peak uh, down near uh, Lathrop, Lathrop State Park um, in the southeast part of the state. And we hope to add Sweetwater um, and near Glenwood Springs to make our 44th state park. Um, that's still kind of in the works. Um, but we do have a lot of visitors that come to our parks every single year. So 11 million is what we had last year. In addition to our parks, we have a lot of state wildlife areas. And so those are mainly for habitat management, but there are some recreation opportunities that happen there. There's some shooting ranges and um, hunting can happen on those lands. And so it's kind of like a multiple use type land. Uh, we also have 19 fish hatcheries across the state. Um, part of our mission is to provide recreational opportunities in angling. And we do grow a lot of our fish um, to stock ponds and rivers and lakes throughout Colorado. Um, it's a really unique stocking process. A lot of times for our upper alpine lakes, it's stuffed by plane. And so we have pilots that will go in and um, drop our fish into those lakes. Um, we have wildlife officers that hike in fish. And then we also by, uh, hike it in or by horseback. Um, and then we also have trucks that will come up to our lakes. Uh, Ridgeway gets a few different types of fish stocked every single year. And we usually get it by truck. And they usually stock us like 250 or 500 fish at a time, depending on how big their tanks are and how much oxygen they can give the fish at one time. Um, another thing that CPW prides itself in is wildlife research, um, terrestrial and aquatic. So that's animals that are on land and then animals that are in the water. Um, each region, we have four regions in our state, um, we have a biologist dedicated to both of those topics in each of those regions of the state. So a little bit about our funding. Um, we are not tax funded. And so this is just kind of a breakdown of where our, our funding comes from. It can be a little confusing, but our biggest um, funding is by users. Uh, license and passes is up there. And so user fees, um, like hunting and fishing licenses, park passes, those types of things fund our parks and wildlife areas and our, our, our research. Another part that's pretty big is GOCO, which is Great Outdoors Colorado. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, the legislature 
pass the bill um, for 25 more years, we can be lottery funded, uh, or we, we can receive part of lottery funds, uh, which definitely helps out our funding a lot. And then in terms of expenditures, this is just kind of a breakdown of um, what we spend on. I think our biggest is organizational support. So um, really like park management and um, infrastructure updates, um, staffing. And then the second biggest piece of that pie is habitat management. So wildlife is a huge part of our agency's mission. And so making sure that there's like deer fencing or um, uh, accustomating a lot of different species and making sure that they have what they need to survive. So here's a map of Colorado. This is all of our state parks minus uh, Fisher's Peak, uh, which is down in that southeast part of the, the state, down by Trinidad Lake. But where we are is right here, Ridgeway, Colorado. Um, we're about 25 minutes south of Montrose or 20 minutes north of Uray, Colorado. So a little bit about us. Um, we have three sections in our park. And so the main section of our park, uh, which is Dutch Charlie, opened in 1989. Um, we are owned by the Bureau of Reclamation. And that is in part because of the water that we have on our park. So we have a thousand acre reservoir. And then um, the rest of our park is 3,000 acres of land. And so the Bureau of Reclamation owns that land and we lease it from them. Um, we manage, Colorado Parks and Wildlife manages the recreational aspects of the park and um, they kind of, the Bureau of Reclamation looks to us for recreational decisions and uh, infrastructure decisions and especially natural resource decisions. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. So when we were at Crawford mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> yeah. she said, said Crawford was owned by the farmers in that area for the uh, irrigation and she also said that Bridgeway was owned. By the oh, I think it's a little bit of misinformation. I'm sure Crawford is. Um, I don't know much about Crawford, but there are every lake in Colorado is kind of case by case. Uh, another incident would be Harvey Gap State Park over by Silt, Colorado, and Rifle, Colorado. It's owned by the farmers uh, yeah. in that area, and that's purely used for irrigation. So I'm sure Crawford is similar. But there's quite a few um, lakes throughout Colorado that are also Bureau of Reclamation owned. Um, so ours would be one, and then I think Rifle Gap is also owned, and then um, like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers owns Chatfield State Park. So there's a lot of different federal owners of the land, and it's really for the dams that are there. And then they look to the state parks to do the, the operational and recreational management of it. But farmers, good question. The farmers don't own. But the farmers, correct. The farmers do not own okay. originally. Um, yeah. yeah. But good question. Uh huh. So thank you for the question. However, our general format is it's we don't have questions until the end. Okay. I would just forget it by so, <laughs> so, 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 so the last 15 minutes and then get up and then I go down for a while. Yeah, okay, thanks, Judy. Um, and then similarly going on um, who manages kind of the water day to day, Tri County Water manages at the dam. Um, so there's really three entities that work together to make Bridgeway what it is. So like I was saying, there's three entrances to the park. Um, Dutch Charlie is one of them, uh, Dallas Creek is one of them, and then Paco Chupac, uh, which is a mouthful to say, but um, with some practice, I believe that you can do it. Um, we have three campgrounds um, within two parts of the park. Uh, we have almost 300 campsites, um, 50 picnic sites, which are accessible to all, um, 21 miles of trail. Uh, we really manage for different types of recreation, like mountain biking, hiking, um, we have a track chair, which I'll talk about later, um, and then a lot of different fishing, angling, boating, all those types of things. Uh, we also have a marina at the park, and so we have 32 slips and 21 buoys that are rentable um, for multiple durations, and I'll get into that a little bit later. So here's a map of our park if you haven't been there. Um, the first part of the park we're going to talk about is Dutch Charlie, right here. And so this is just an overview of what our campgrounds look like. Uh, we have two, diff our visitor center, let's start with that, is on the very left side of your screen. 
there, and um, we have a great trail that's right off the visitor center called Forest Discovery, and it's great for kids. Uh, it's shaded, it's about a mile long, and we have a brochure. We have a few trails throughout the park that have that are self-guided, and so Forest Discovery is one of those, and we have brochures at the the park that um, can talk about the history, some of the natural features of the trail, and it's just nice to get to know the trail without having a naturalist be there or go to a program if you're not able to make one of our programs. Um, unique to this part of the park, uh, we have our campsites, and these are all electric, and uh, we also have three yurts, which is down in the Dakota Terraces part of the park, which is on the lower part of the map there, and they're really unique because um, I think they're kind of more towards glamping, but it's really great for um, the winter because they are propane heated, and they have like a microwave and a refrigerator, uh, they have bunk beds, <laughs> and then it has kind of a nice dome that you can do some stargazing out of. So it's, it really lends itself to a very comfortable night stay. Um, in, the, in the summer, it's air conditioned, so it's really nice if you want a little bit of camping or um, if you just want to be kind of in like a cabin cabin setting. Um, those are open year round. For the winter, we do close our campsites around like October, and the only loop that stays open is that yurt loop, and so there's really only 20 sites that we have available in the winter just because of the pure amount of snow that we receive, and so it's just easier for us to plow those sites and have those available, and we're also not as popular for tent camping, obviously, when we have a few feet of snow out there. Um, but that being said, we do keep one of our tent loops open in case somebody is interested in tent camping. Um, also on this map is our marina and our boat ramp, which is on the right side of the slide. And uh, we have quite a few changes that have happened this last year that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, yeah, so this part of the park was open in 1989. This is the original part of the park. And so the unique part of our park is that it opened in segments. And so this is the first segment to be opened. And this is the majority of our trails. Um, and this is just kind of a breakdown of what our sites, the majority of our sites are. So the next part of our park is Dallas Creek. This is our day use part of the park, and it's really popular with paddle boarders and kayakers. Um, it's a big weightless zone uh, on the water. Uh, we do have a concessionaire that runs paddle boards and um, kayaks, I believe. I think just paddle boards over there, actually. Um, but that's also where the Uncompahgre River comes in, and so it's also popular with day use um, rafting or floating from the town of Bridgeway. It's about five miles by river. Um, on that part of the river, we do have an, a takeout spot. It's not all that developed, but we would like to make it develop as we get more use in that part of the park. Um, I think one of my favorite trails is over there. It's the Nature Trail. And so similarly to Forest Discovery at um, uh, Dutch Charlie, it's a self-guided brochure that you can take. And uh, it's really nice for birding and has really great views of Mount Snapples and the San Juans over there. There's a lot of benches if you just want to sit and enjoy as well. So this section opened in 1991 and it's definitely our, our day use area of the park. Um, at our park our day use means it closes at 10 and it opens back up at um, 5 a.m. So the last part of the park is Paco Chipuk. And this means Cow Creek in Ute. And sometimes we call it Paco for short, or just Cow Creek. So here's a map of that part of the park. Um, starting at the left side, that's kind of where our dam is. And that's where Tri-County Water and the Bureau of Reclamation sit. And they manage all of the inflows and outflows and make sure that everything's going the way it needs to go. Um, the next couple weeks, we are going to be dropping about two feet of water. Um, we do have water um, rights owners that are requesting more water, so to fulfill their rights, um, we will be dropping. So if you do see the reservoir a little bit lower, that is why. Um, but we, we do fluctuate quite a bit uh, throughout the season due to water rights um, owners and what their needs are with irrigation. 
Um, earlier in the season, they did drop it uh, quite, I think, six feet at one time because a culvert um, had kind of gone down, so they had to drain it really quick to fix that and to get access to it, and then they brought it back up. So sometimes when you see the water fluctuating, it's for a lot of different reasons and for management purposes. Um, one of our, my second favorite trail um, is Enchanted Mesa, and that trail heads kind of towards the bottom of the map in the middle. And um, it has great views of Mount Snuffles and the lake, and it's about two and a half miles one way. Uh, you can extend it with, by doing an extra mile in our cove, if you'd like as well. But it's kind of steep going up, and then you get on top of the mesa and it levels out, and it's really nice. But that first part is steep, and it's not great for bikes if you're trying to hike your bike up those stairs. Um, the other parts of our park, um, in the middle of the map, we have our group event facilities, and um, those are really popular in the summer. We can hope pretty much every weekend we have one to four events, and sometimes hosting up to 250 people. So it's great for um, reunions or staff picnics or weddings. Um, it's it's a really nice facility, and uh, we have three, we have two different pavilions, and then we have kind of like a stage area in between. Um, additionally, we have our tail waters in this part of the park, and it's really popular for fly fishing. We do have a commercial guided um, fishing, um, a commercial fishing guide uh, that guides on there. And then we have two ponds, and we do a lot of our fishing clinics at those ponds. They are stocked a few times a year and it's great for kids. And every first Saturday of the month, we have a kids clinic from nine to 11. And so it's nice to bring them up for family. And we do give away free fishing poles and we rig them up for you and um, teach you different ways to fish. Sometimes we do a fly fishing clinic here and there as well. Um, in addition to our day use activities, we have uh, two loops that are full hookups and are really popular for our RVers. Um, we do have one tent loop that's kind of up towards the top of the park, and that's open year round. And so this park was at this part of the park was added last, 1995, to round out um, our our entire property. And this is just kind of a breakdown of what our campgrounds look like. So this is our facilities by the numbers. Uh, we have quite a bit of restrooms um, to accommodate for all of our users. Um, but I think unique to our park, we have camper services buildings, uh, which has laundry and showers. We have free showers. Um, playgrounds, which is really popular with our families. And then some vending machines, other facilities. We do have two maintenance shops, which helps us out with our gear management. We have a lot of vehicles, and so having one shop dedicated to vehicles and another shop dedicated to our gear has been really helpful. Um, 21 miles of trail, it may not seem like that much, but if you've tried to tackle a lot of our trails, it'll take some time, that's for sure. Um, we are open in the winter, and so um, we d when we get enough snow, we do groom, kind of, well, we don't really groom it, but I think a lot of our locals will groom kind of a cross-country ski trail down at Dallas Creek on our sidewalk. And um, it's great for, for cross-country skiing and snowshoeing. Uh, but this, this year was a really light snow year, so we didn't get that much. We didn't get as much to make those trails. Um, let's see. Great, so talking about our staff, um, we have nine full-time employees year-round, and uh, they help with a lot of different aspects of the park. Um, our park manager and free rangers, so John and I, are included in that. And uh, so us four are all fully commissioned officers. So we have the same training as like our troopers and we go through police academy and we have a lot of training that we can keep up with every year. Uh, but that just helps us respond to emergencies a lot faster and to work well with our county and our um, Colorado State Patrol troopers. Uh, since we are right on the highway, there's a lot of accidents that we respond to and we're just the closest. And so it really helps out our um, emergency response teams, and especially out on the water as well. Uh, we do have free park resource technicians, which kind of help out with the um, property management of our park, and so they'll provide guidance on trail maintenance, um, any maintenance on our facilities, and then kind of the vision of kind of our forestry management plan. We do have an admin assistant that runs our front office, and then a marina manager 
um, that works down on the marina since we have so many buoys and slips. Uh, it's, it's a pretty big program that we're really trying to develop a little bit more and provide more resources to the community. Uh, we would not be able to do our operations without all of our seasonal staff and our volunteers. Um, they definitely make everything possible. Um, as you can see by our numbers, that's 80 people that help us with operations um, between the months of April and October. Uh, we do have a few volunteers that stay with us in the winter and help us out with snow removal and maintenance and via camp post. But of those 30 seasonal staff, um, you can see the, the list of the positions that we have and so keeping those filled are definitely imperative to our operations. Um, our rangers, we do uh, commission them for a limited commission so they can write parks and wildlife related citations and they can help us out with um, emergencies that come up on the park and just provide a lot of customer service uh, throughout the park and answer questions. Our gate staff, we have three entrances like I said before and so they are, um, they're staffed throughout the day just to answer questions, sell park passes, hand out maps, um, answer questions about the surrounding area. And then we have boat inspectors. Um, our lake is open from uh, March until, oct excuse me, October when we, um, we don't actually ice up our entire lake because of the river that, kind of, that inflows in it, but we do, our boat ramp does ice up so it makes it hard and impossible at times to launch a boat. Um, our boat inspectors do go through a state mandated uh, program to make sure that they're inspecting boats. We're looking for aquatic and species, um, so mainly the zebra and quagga mussels that come out of Lake Powell. And so since we're so close and we're neighbors with them, we often see a lot of boats that even after they have been cleaned at Lake Powell, they still have mussels on their boats. And um, this program has really been successful since 2008 in uh, keeping those out of our state. And um, a lot of states have based their program on our model that we created, which we're really excited that other states have wanted to adopt it just because of the natural travesties that uh, the zebra and quagga mussels can cause on our infrastructure and uh, natural resources. So that's, it's a big program that may seem small, especially if you are a voter, and um, doing those incoming and outgoing inspections of your boat, it really goes a long way. Um, we are fortunate to have a naturalist at our park. Um, our naturalist has been with us for, I think, five years, and uh, she's just really wonderful and has a great teaching background. But we do have a few different programs that are offered every week, um, Friday through Sunday. And I think our biggest one is our summer speaker series, and that's on Friday and Saturday nights at 7.30 at our visitor center. We try to feature a lot of locals and them in their um, respective fields. So for this, like last week, we had some someone talk about NASA. Um, we talked about native plants. Um, we've had wildlife researchers out. It's really just a variety of topics to um, kind of supplement what's going on at the park and to learn about the area. Um, I think this week we have a few people coming from um, uh, your Ray Mountain guy to talk about climbing in San Juan. So just a lot of different topics of interest and uh, just to learn more about the area. With our volunteers, I think our biggest um, group of volunteers are camp hosts. And so what they primarily do is um, they clean our sites. So they make sure it's free of trash and they uh, clean up the ashes after people use them in the fireplace. And then um, they also answer a lot of questions. They handle um, some of our reservation issues. Um, when there's campsite mix-ups, and so they're kind of the go-to for that. They sell firewood and ice, and then we also have hammock stands that we uh, hand out for free. And so they really help us keep our campgrounds all smooth as much as we can. Um, we do have a friends group, which is unique to our park. Not all parks have a friends group, but it's really a, a separate organization that's a nonprofit that will help fund a lot of different projects that the park cannot cover with their operating budget. So an example would be they have funded a lot of different pavilions on our park. Um, so bigger groups in the campgrounds can have a place for like their family reunion um, or like a meeting. And it's just kind of a nice outdoor space that, um, that people can meet at. They also fund some education programs throughout the year. A lot of our schools have um, the barriers of transportation to the park, so they will fund partial transportation and busing from elementary schools or middle schools to our parks so that they can come to our programs. 
which is fantastic. Um, and then I talked about our women volunteers. So some significant programs that um, I've kind of talked about. We have our campgrounds, which is our majority of our visitation to the park, um, fishing, boating, our volunteer program. Um, I guess what I didn't mention yet is uh, we have received a lot of awards for our um, volunteer contributions towards the park. And so last year we logged 21,000 hours, which is a lot of hours. And so, like I mentioned before, our operations could not be possible without them. Um, our goal this year is 22,000. We'll see if we'll get there. Um, our interpretive programs, it's quite large. Uh, what we do year round, um, our naturalist covers a lot of our programs. Um, some of the things that we do, in addition to offering just programs at the park, are um, you know, raptor monitoring that goes on in the background. So we're just looking at um, red-tailed hawks, um, eagles, owls, and their nesting habits. Um, throughout the parks, so we have a lot of volunteers that dedicate their time to that type of research, and it goes into our statewide database so that we can kind of monitor um, any migrations or, um, I guess, patterns that happen on the park. Uh, in addition to that, we also have bluebird monitoring, and we have different bluebird boxes throughout the park, and we have volunteers that check those to see kind of how the populations of our bluebirds are doing, if they're fledging or failing. Um, when that time comes, if there's uh, other birds like sparrows or, um, oh, I can't think of it right now, but uh, if there's other birds that are using those nests and taking those birds out. So it's just like really interesting information to see what is going on in the park um, in our natural resource setting. In addition to that, we have a lot of different programs um, where uh, we work with other organizations throughout uh, Montrose, Delta, and Uray um, to have school groups come and uh, learn about the park or different topics that they would like to do. We do have a group that's been um, kind of new to the area, and so we've been working with our kids to do kind of like a, a skills day, and so we did like an archery clinic for them all day, and plus fishing, and then uh, did like a birding station, and so that was in April, and then in August we're gonna do um, something similar but with uh, paddleboard skills, and so just like on the water skills. Uh, we're really excited about that. A lot of grants have helped to make that possible. And then our marina store. It's gotten a lift recently. If you haven't been down there, um, we've rearranged some stuff. We have some new retail items that are down there. Um, it's kind of a really fun place to be. Uh, we have a few things that we can rent. Uh, our pontoons, we have three pontoons uh, that vary from five people to I think 12. 12 people, maybe 10 people um, on them, so you can run for a half day or a full day. And then our newest addition to our fleet is our pedal boats, which are really fun. You can um, fit five people in it. They have a nice little shade topper, and you can bring all your coolers. Uh, I recently posted it on Facebook. I run our social media, and um, oh my gosh, it just exploded. <laughs> so I didn't realize that our community loved those so much, but we got a lot of views and a lot of likes. Um, with those, so I'm glad that they're being utilized so quickly. Um, our inflatable towable wraps, um, we do have a hot dog, which is kind of fun, and then we have those normal saucers that can be towed behind your boat. Um, those have been really popular as well. Um, our seasonal short-term buoy rentals, uh, we have a few that can be rented out for the season, which I think is, you can run them for six months, or you can do um, by the day or by the week, so it really lends itself to if you're um, just from out of state and you want to put your boat somewhere, we do have a few that are dedicated to that. For our seasonal rentals, we do have a long list of wait, <laughs> a long wait list. So if you're interested in getting one, please get in there quickly um, for next year. And then we also have seasonal dry storage, which is down at um, our Paco Chupa part of the park. And we can do RVs or boats or um, something similar. Similarly to our rentals, those are pretty, uh, our wait list is pretty long for that. So some other programs that we have, um, our concessions, uh, I think I mentioned we have a fly fishing guide down at Paco on the river, and then we also have the same company um, running paddle boards out there, and then our concessions at the marina. Um, which are pretty popular. I guess I haven't talked about our swim beach. We do have a swim beach um, down near the marina and it's great for families. It's um, really like some sand that we 
We keep pretty groomed. Um, we do test it once a week for E. coli, and so you can know that at the very least that area is tested. Uh, we don't allow dogs because of the testing, um, but there's a lot of other areas that you can bring your dogs, such as Dallas Creek, and you can still be on the shoreline and still have a nice beach day. Um, some special events that we have throughout the year. Uh, Lake Appreciation Day, we are not doing that this year just um, due to some COVID restrictions and then um, just kind of our staffing. But typically we do um, some boat tours out on the water. So it's like history and um, some natural resource um, showcasings of that. We usually have some of our partners like the Forest Service or BLM and then some local businesses out there. Um, and then we usually have some food. So it's usually a great day and we hope to do it next year um, in July. Weddings and reunions at our um, group event facilities are pretty big. And from time to time we, have, we host triathlons um, pretty consistently. In the last couple of years we've had a cross country race down there in September and we will host it this, again this year. In the fall, we have um, hunting on parts of the park. I would review the regulations or ask our visitor center or um, talk to one of our rangers about where those parts of the park are just so you're legal. Um, I guess I haven't talked about the east side of our park. Um, it's really open about half of the year and it's closed for um, wildlife management in the winter just for some of the nesting habits that happen and um, kind of some winter range for our um, for our wildlife that's coming down to lower elevations. But those that part of the park does hook up with the Bridgeway area trails, the rat trails. And so there's some ATV trails and some mountain bike trails that are really popular over there. So I highly recommend if you really don't want to be around a lot of people, that's a great place to kind of get away and still be in, still be in the park. Um, wildfire prevention. We work with the Colorado State Forest Service on um, kind of wildlife plans. And um, they just wrote up a, a new management plan for us, and it really helps us kind of know what our natural resources are at the park and uh, how to manage them successfully with, um, with the experts in mind. Um, talking about our retail program at our visitor center and our marina, um, we have a lot of different things that can be bought um, to commemorate your stay, or if you just want, um, we do have a lot of books uh, from the area. And weed management, every park has to deal with this. Um, difficult weeds to remove or invasive species uh, is definitely on, our, on the front side of our minds. So we have a, a few different ways that we manage our weeds. And then the fun part of my job is snowmobile and OHV patrol. Um, at Colorado Parks and Wildlife, we do manage all the trails in Colorado. So even if it's not on the park, we work with the Forest Service and BLM and um, kind of in tandem to do patrols. Um, whether and mostly on our patrols for snowmobile, we have five snowmobile clubs that we work with down at Ridgeway, and it's from Norwood to Silverton. It's a really big area to encompass the um, Uncompahgre Plateau and then uh, part of the San Juans, and then also over on the Alpine Plateau, kind of near um, Blue Mesa Reservoir. And so we have five grooming clubs. Uh, that we pay, uh, they're contracted out to us, and so they make sure that the trails are in good condition, and so we'll go out there and make sure that that's happening, and then we can report trail conditions to our snowmobilers, and then also, um, especially in San Juan's when there's a lot of avalanches, and just kind of what the degree of risk is um, for the day. We really try to communicate that out to everyone um, when we're on the trail or through our social media and work with, um, work with those agencies that really specialize in that. But then we're also checking for registration. Um, registration of snowmobiles and OHVs go back into the trail management. So those uh, on the snowmobile side, the grooming of the trails, and then on the OHV side, um, mostly counties take care of those trails or uh, BLM or Forest Service, so that really helps that kind of funding of that management side. Um, OHVs, we do similar things on patrol. We're looking for registration and then trail conditions. Um, CPW is kind of the leader in if there's like an accident or something, so we have the forms and the training to respond to those um, in addition to working with our local EMS. So some of our new programs and projects, um, this is my favorite slide because there's so much to talk about. Um, Keep Colorado Wild Pass. Um, for Colorado residents, our Pass is going to be changing this year, starting January 1, 2023. 
um, the Colorado Wild Pass is going to be tied to your vehicle registration instead of if you would like to buy it on your own. So it's gonna be an opt-out program. So if you would like to not have a park pass, there's a box that you check, uncheck, to not have a park pass. Um, the cost of it is gonna be significantly less. It's gonna be $29 per car um, instead of $80, which is an annual pass um, on a fix to your car or a hang tag, which is 120. Um, our passes are not going to change for out-of-state residents, and so you can still, uh, if you're an out-of-state resident, meaning if you have a, a license plate with like a, an out-of-state license plate, so you still can buy the $80 pass or have the hang tag, and that will still be for our out-of-state folks. Uh, our park daily passes will still remain $9 for those that are out of state, or if you opted out of the Colorado Wild Pass, it'll still be the day pass. Um, so if you really don't see yourself going to state parks, that's okay, you can opt out. Or if you go for one day, you can just buy the day pass. So we're really looking forward to that. I think it's gonna make things a lot easier on our administrative side, and I think it'll attract a lot of people where the barriers of $80 and $120, is just gonna meet people kind of in the middle and have a better price point for, um, to reduce the barrier of entry. So we're looking forward to that. There's quite a few things that we're still changing. So if you want to stay kind of up on what's going on, we do have a website that's dedicated to Colorado Wild Pass. I would just suggest putting that into Google and it'll pull up um, all the things that are um, recent with those. Um, another goal at the park is we're trying to become more accessible to all. And so two of those programs um, would be, we do have now a floating wheelchair um, to get into our swim beach. And uh, we also have a new mat that will be on our swim beach um, to make uh, it more accessible for wheelchairs. So you can um, wheel down straight to the water. Um, they're really heavy, but they'll stay down there permanently. So we're really excited about that um, so we can just be more accessible. Um, in addition to those pieces, we do have a new track chair program. Um, a track chair is a wheelchair that's kind of like um, more beefed up, so it can take a lot of uh, like rocks or scree, and it, it's more stable, and it can go on a lot of trails that um, wheelchairs may not be able to go on just due to the tire width or length or type of tire. So um, Staunton State Park over in Denver has had a successful program for the last couple of years and so we're modeling after them. We received a track chair from them and then through grants we received another track chair um, that we're hoping can be dedicated to hunting and fishing. Um, so we do uh, a few hunts in the fall that are dedicated to those with the, um, that need more accessibility. And so we're hoping that this can solve some of our um, barriers into getting more of those folks further out into the outdoors. And um, yeah, and we just got a um, trailer for them too, so we can house them and um, really bring them maybe outside of the park as well. They weigh about 1,200 pounds, so moving them is not an easy deal. Um, our group campground, we are looking to expand our campgrounds. Our visitation is just, we are very popular, and so really from May till October, we're pretty much booked every day. Um, and it's really hard to get into our campgrounds, so expansion is definitely on our minds. Um, so we're hoping for all the events that we host, uh, it can be dedicated to, um, to those reunions or those weddings that would like to stay over and stay as a group as a group of 30 instead of buying like six or eight different sites and you may not be close to those people. And so I think it'll really address some of our, um, our noise complaints that happen at night because of families that just wanna gather, um, but then also just providing a space so everyone can be together. In addition to that, we're looking for a camp, an employee campground, and we're going to be having that start. It's been approved, and it'll be down at um, Paco Chupac part of the park. And if you're familiar with the park, it's going to be next to F Loop. And uh, we hope that that can really solve our housing, um, not crisis, but um, issue, because when we're trying to attract seasonal employees, I think housing is just such a barrier since we're so far from Montreal. Well, we're not too far, but a 25 minute drive or a 20 minute, 20 minute drive from Uray or a 15 minute drive from Ridgeway. Um, it just enables us to have more, more people stay on the park um, at a lower cost for everybody. And in addition to that, all the volunteers that we have. So together between seasonal um, employees and 
um, volunteer, and we have about 80 people, so the more that we can provide um, and make our park attractive, I think we're gonna be able to retain more um, short-term employees uh, year after year and, and volunteers. Um, our park master, our park management master plan. Uh, this just came to fruition. Um, we just had a new one come up, and so it really addresses some of our like five, ten-year like like goals. And so um, one of them would be um, updating our infrastructure since we were built in the late '80s, early '90s. There's obviously some things that need to be changed. So some of our challenges, um, I've kind of already talked about some of these things on the slide, but with our high visitation um, and use, we just want to still remain, still have a positive experience for everyone that's visiting our park, and so we really want to balance those. You know, we're, we're really happy that so many people want to come out, but we still want to like, provide a quality experience. Um, natural resource protection, as we grow, we still want to um, honor all of the wildlife that come into our park and use it as their home, and so just, really balancing those uh, is always a challenge, but we really would just want to keep in mind what what priority needs to take precedent at, at what time. And then our aging infrastructure, um, our park management plan kind of addresses that. And then our employee recruitment and retention, I think our employee campgrounds um, will really help us in that department um, just really stay more competitive um, compared to other parks or other jobs in the area. Um, our budget restriction op in operational costs, I feel like that's every park, um, but we're really fortunate to have our friends group that can fundraise for us, um, and so that's, that's a huge thing. Um, we've also applied for a lot of grants, so our track chair program was uh, funded in part by the grant program. So there are other ways that we're looking at that, and uh, we do think as an agency that the Colorado Wild Pass is going to address some of those uh, issues and, and bring up revenue a little bit. And just to talk about our um, cultural resources and natural resources, this is kind of an overview of what is available on the park. Um, we are in a pinyon juniper forest, which is a high desert environment. So we do have cacti, we do have um, uh, paintbrush, uh, we do have pinyon and juniper trees. Uh, there's a lot of different plants that are, that are in our park. Uh, wildlife, we are a haven for deer. We do have the resident park deer, and no, we don't let them out or put them in every day. <laughs> they are just free to be. Um, we have a lot of birds. Um, with our raptor monitoring and bluebird program, that really helps us get the research that we need. And then aquatic and fishery species, just in Moore Lake, we have a lot to manage in that department. And then from the history side, um, the town of Dallas um, used to be at Dallas Creek, and so we have a, a few different historical things down there. There are some, still some artifacts sometimes that you can find on the trail. Uh, we do ask that you just leave them alone so that they can uh, be viewed by other, other park visitors. And then we also do have our youth sites. Um, and we are a very sacred place. Um, we do have our TP that's up every year to dedicate um, that part of the park, um, and we do have a close a lot of programs in there. Everyone is welcome to go on the TV if you do know this park. So I think that's all I have right now, so I think we can open it up to questions. First of all, thank you, Erin. That was amazing. You're welcome. Thank you. If you have a question, I'll bring you the mic. Uh, 
Is any of that money going to go to hiking trails in the wilderness, et cetera, et cetera? Um, in terms of wilderness, most likely not, since that's most likely um, housed with the Forest Service. Um, does, wilderness designated areas. Um, for park management, it will most likely go towards park management, um, like infrastructure needs or um, daily operations. That's my understanding at this time. Okay, I know, I know you have a lot of bear boxes. Yes. Do you have bears? I mean, I've never seen one, I've never seen scat, so I'm just... Yeah, no, great question. Um, currently right now, for the last, I'd say three weeks, we've had two bears that are hanging out at Papa Chupac, um near our walk-in tent sites, which is H Loop. And, um, and then it's also been on the Enchanted Mesa Trail and also in F Loop, which is kind of by the highway. Um, they're pretty big bears. Um, they have not caused any human, um, there hasn't been human wildlife conflict yet. Um, but we do encourage everyone to use the bear boxes, especially if, um, if you're tent camping with us because those can block. Um, if you want to, um, I would also recommend blocking all of your food or any scented items, especially like hygiene items like toothpaste or deodorant because those still attract the bears. Um, putting them in your locked car. Um, if you want to keep them in a cooler, I would suggest, suggest it be a cooler that locks because bears are very crafty and they can get into a lot of things. Um, even if they can get into your car if it's not locked as well. So um, that's, what I, that's what I recommend. Mm -hmm. Also on the, um, uh, on the um, checking the box. So you check the box to get a pass. Yes. How do you get a pass then? Yes, uh, it'll just be linked to your driver's or your vehicle registration. So there will not be anything to display. So how would they know then at, at the booth when you check in? That is something we're still working out. Um, <laughs> I think uh, when you have a Colorado license plate, it's going to be, um, you'll just go through. Um, there might be times where you would be requested to show proof of it. And so your driver's, um, sorry, I keep saying driver's um, vehicle registration, it would have it listed on box. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Um, our Colorado pass expires uh, in August, mm -hmm. but our vehicles don't register until April. Mm -hmm. So do we still just pay the regular fee next month? Yes, and there will be a prorated rebate um, for the months that you don't use on your park pass. And so it's, it's going to be complicated, I'm not going to lie, but there is going to be a way where you'll get a rebate and it'll be based on the number of months that you don't use it. Thank you. Yeah. Is it until the end of August? Yeah, Correct, yes. Any park pass, um, despite which date you buy it during the month, it's always good until the last day of the month. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, Jim, you wait for me. Oh. <laughs> get your steps in. That's right. So your position up there, is it is that senior ranger? Um, no, I'm a park ranger, and I have a counterpart um, who also is a park ranger, and then we have a senior ranger and a park manager. Currently, our senior ranger position is vacant. Um, John was our senior ranger, and he um, promoted us. Are you going to apply for that? I have. <laughs> 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 so the um, question I have is, what uh, what do you view opportunities for um, for women in Colorado Parks and Wildlife? Yeah, I think that um, that's a really good question. And I think that our agency does a really good job of making sure that the opportunities are equal. Um, and it's really based on you know who's the best candidate. Um, for the position and um, all the training, but I would say that I've been treated very equally um, and that our agency really values um, women. I have a question, but I'm going to put a plug in if you're a woman user of the parks. Yeah. There is the coolest thing coming up. It's called Women's Cast and Blast Weekend that CPW does. Um, and I did it a few years ago. The application deadline, I think, is the 3rd of August. And you basically get to go spend a weekend at Lone Cone um, Wildlife Area, and you do archery, um, rifle, or shotgun, not rifle, shotgun, archery, and fishing. Um, and then you don't have to bring anything except like your own sleeping bag. Or you can stay in the little cabin. So you can camp 
horse in the cabin. It is so fun. And it's it's basically free because CPW wants to attract more women to um, those outdoor programs. So if you want to know more, I was going to ask me, but really probably ask her or check in <laughs> at the local office. Um, my question was, um, I love that you're expanding all the camping because it is um, always hard to get a spot, especially those yurts. Any, and you talked about expanding the group and expanding the other campground. Any thought to adding more yurts or teepees to the facilities? Yes, um, that is definitely on our minds and we'd like to um, convert some of our um, campsites that are next to our yurts into more yurts. I think that's kind of like the five to 10 years plan. Um, but it is something that we are looking at um, because our yurts are so popular. <laughs> um, and two of them are um, pet friendly and one of them is not pet friendly to accommodate those who have allergies. And so we're pretty strict on that. So really, if you have a pet, they really are two yurts. And so good question. Yes, we would like to expand. I think it's admirable of you to consider having employee camping. Yes. I hadn't realized that before, but yes, if those people can stay on site in their own whatever, RV trailer. Yes. That solves a whole bunch of problems. Yeah, it definitely does. And we currently have a few spots at one of our maintenance shops where we, um, we have our like, rangers who can bring trailers. Um, and we have full hookups for them. We also do have three trailers that we um, we provide for our rangers pr primarily. Mm -hmm. This may be best answered by fish and game, but I know there's an effort to eliminate smallmouth bass from the reservoir. And uh, I fish up there sometimes, and I've caught quite a few fish, but I've yet to catch one smallmouth bass. Are you winning on that? <laughs> it's funny that you bring that up because right now we have our smallmouth bass tournament going on and it uh, started G July 16th and it goes till September 3rd and it is to help manage that population to um, get that population down and so there are cash prizes for it there's a whole lot of rules um, but we do have it all online um, it is on our Facebook page our uh, visitor center has a full list of the rules if you'd like to get involved but yes um, we view them for our fishery, the way that our um, biologists would like to manage the, the lake is to reduce that population so that other more native populations can grow. And so that's kind of the, the thinking behind that. Does that help answer? Yeah, okay. My question has to do with employment. When I taught at the high school, there were a lot of local kids who would have liked whether they needed a four-year degree or had opportunities otherwise to work um, in your area, but it was way too competitive. Is it still so competitive? It's still very competitive, um, but I, I hope that that's not a barrier to um, pursuing or um, wanting to apply to the position. Um, a little bit of background, so if you would like to be interested in full-time employment as a park ranger, um, they, uh, the agency does require a four-year degree. Um, on the ranger side, it's just a four degree in anything, as long as you have some work experience or interest in the natural resource field. Um, if you're looking to go that route and you don't have like a natural resource type degree or biology degree, then I do recommend maybe doing a, an internship or a short-term employment with Colorado Parks and Wildlife just so you can know a little bit more about the agency and, and what the priorities look like. Um, and that would help you bridge that gap um, getting hired full-time. On the wildlife side, if you're looking for, uh, if you're interested in becoming a wildlife officer, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife does require you to have like a biology type degree um, just because of the, um, the job duties and the wildlife management part of the job is so heavy and so having that background knowledge really lends itself to having more expert types in the field. Um, similarly, I do also recommend doing a, uh, either volunteering or um, doing a, a temporary position with, with uh, CPW. Erin, thank you so much. This, as like I said, it's, it was amazing. I'm sure we all appreciate it. We all learned a lot. Please help me thank her.